Hello everyone and welcome to another video with me 320 Simpilot and today we are going to be taking a flight in the Phoenix A320 for Microsoft Flight Simulator and what this is going to be is a guide for you on how you're going to set up your aircraft, load it up, uh, load up the computers, power it on, get the engines up and running and then uh, taxi out and take off. So this will be a complete cold and dark guide for those of you who never flown the Airbus before and maybe some extra information for those who already know how to use it. This is of course an upcoming uh, highly detailed A320 for Microsoft Flight Simulator. It's a really remarkable add-on. I've been on the Alpha and Beta teams over the last couple of months, although my contribution has been small, but nonetheless it is an amazing thing to use and I hope that this guide will help those of you who are coming to the Airbus because of it to get up and running. But we'll also look at the specific process for using this add-on, so how we load it using the EFB and uh, also little details like that. This is a pre-release build, it is not the final build, so please keep that in mind for the video. If you see something not quite right, this is not the final build. It will be changing as time goes on. And I am a real-world Airbus pilot, so I'm going to hopefully give you some extra context and bits of information that, uh, that will help you with your home simulations. But of course, none of this is for any real-world use. Right, we are parked on stand here in Brussels, and we're going to fly or set up our flight for a departure from Brussels to head over to London Heathrow. Let's get started. Before we do, I'd just like to remind you about our partnership with Apex Gaming PCs, where you can get one of the 320 Simpilot line of gaming PCs. You can customize them on the website, use the code 320 Simpilot for a discount, and you'll be supporting the channel if you do buy one. First of all, we need to have a plan for our flight. This is something that all airlines will do. It's done for the pilots usually automatically because we just don't have time and it's not efficient use of pilots to have them planning their flights as well as, uh, as flying them. So the system I'm going to use is Simbrief. I highly recommend using Simbrief. It is a free tool you can use. I'll provide a link in the description and here's a couple of screenshots of going through the Simbrief options. So you can load it up and enter the flight you want to do. You can put in your call sign, you can put in the weights. I have a specific Phoenix Simbrief profile which will become available of course and we can also choose how much Pass, how many passengers we'll have and the, the cargo load and so on. So what you do is you type all this information in, then you can just generate the flight and it will give you a plan, including a route. So that's what I'm going to use for today. However, of course, you can plan this using the Microsoft Flight Simulator flight planning tool, but I highly recommend using SimReef as it's integrated so well into the Phoenix itself and it's very easy to use, very simple. So that is uh, something I will highly, highly recommend. Once that's done, you get uh, a flight plan. Uh, you don't need to do anything else with it. Uh, the, we don't need to download it, we don't need to save it in any specific format or import it into a folder, nothing like that. It's all going to be taken care of and we'll see how in just a moment. It's just great, so simple. And this is how we do it in the airlines. We will simply download, typically these days, our flight plan for our flight. It will have the route generated, expected arrivals, planned fuel, flight times, weather information, all included. And as you'll see in a second, that is how it works here in the Phoenix as well, which is just a total treat to use. Okay, so we've planned our flight and arrived at the gate. We're on gate 215 in Brussels. By the way, this is uh, Aerosoft's mega Brussels airport scenery, which is highly recommended. I think it's great. Even got passengers walking around. Uh, and what I'm going to do first is move over to the EFB because your aircraft may not load up in this exact state the first time you fly the Phoenix. So we're going to log into the EFB, um, passcode there 0000, and I'm going to press the Phoenix app. Now this is the, the route of your simming journey when you fly this aircraft. This app contains so much information. Uh, and first of all, we could go through this, uh, but I'm going to just go to panel states first and make sure you've selected cold and dark because that's what we're going to do on this video today. You can also select turnaround options, which are both very nice as well, but I'm sure people are most interested in seeing uh, cold and dark. So that's what I've got set to my default and that is currently loaded. Okay, great. Next, I'm going to go to my flight and all you have to do is tap to import from Simbrief. Now, I had to enter my Simbrief user ID into the Phoenix standalone software. This Phoenix runs with a separate application that runs alongside. So when you first, only once, when you first load it up, you have to enter your Simbrief number and then it will uh, automatically connect. You only have to do that once and click apply and it's done. It's great. From then on, uh, Phoenix will automatically launch that application when you load Flight Simulator and load the aircraft. So you don't need to think about it after that, just when you're first setting up. So I'm going to tap here and with any luck, my flight plan from Brussels to Heathrow will load up. It even gives us a departure time in 36 minutes. Great stuff. Uh, we're going to be using real time and real weather in the simulator, by the way. 
So there we go, 1740Z is our schedule. Uh, that's in 36 minutes from now. We've got a block time of arrival. You can re-import it in case you change anything. So we're going to use a Phoenix registration for this flight. Uh, we're going to pretend that Phoenix were asked to fly in and operate this for Brussels Airlines. So this gives us a call sign of the uh, B line 2103. Now, next you can scroll through. So it says tap or swipe. I can just tap over here. We get the weather. So here's the weather in Brussels. It is variable two knots, cav okay, 26 degrees. Pretty much gives us a choice of runway. Um, the arrival in Heathrow, it is uh, going to be 1609. So that is actually a slight uh, tailwind for the 27. So landing on nine left, 10 kilometers or more. No cloud, 21 degrees Celsius. So very nice day there as well. Alternate EBOS, uh, strange alternate, but there we go. Um, is 0507 Cavok. Okay, so nice weather all round. And you can actually tap here and view the forecast if you would like to. Good. Route, you can see here, and if I click view map, we can see it, a rough guide. So all very nice. Next, we're going to go to ground surfaces. And here, we're going to want to select a few things. So we have the jetway attached. That's because in my sim settings, I have automatic jetties. So the software will automatically put them there according to the timings. But you can connect it yourself manually if you'd like to or not. We want a GPU, which stands for ground power unit. This provides electrical power to the aircraft. We could start without it. We could just turn on the APU instead, but most realistic is to have the GPU. Airlines will nearly always start off with a GPU plugged in. We're not gonna use PCA or the forward stairs because we have the jetty. Chocks and cones will be on at this point. Uh, we can forget the stairs. And if you like, you can open up the cargo doors, but this is, uh, this is uh, trivia and I'm not uh, compared to operating the aircraft. I don't want to get too bogged down with it because this would be a very long video if we talk about all the details of turnarounds and uh, we can talk about those in later videos and streams. Good. So crucially thing, crucial thing here, GPU plugged in. That's what we need. Next, mass and balance. Here I'm going to check is what I planned, 130 passengers, 2.2 with a planned fuel of 5.3 tons, currently three tons in the aircraft. So I'm gonna click load aircraft. There we go, and it says confirm load aircraft, real time 22, fast time seven. So I'm gonna do real time. I think we have 22 minutes spare. Uh, we're going at 36, and so that would typically happen now. Now you'd normally do this after the aircraft's powered up for simplicity, I'm gonna do it this way. So fuel is going on, it's loading up the cargo, and the passengers are starting to board. That's the first one. You can actually see a list of passengers as well. How fun is that? <laughs> and you can see their, um, their different levels within the airline and so on. Very cool. Great, so that is the aircraft now loading. Panel states we have already done, so we're not gonna fiddle with that. And then sim settings will not be relevant to us for now. So that's good. We'll go back to the home screen on that. So I'm also going to go to Navigraph and just set my charts up now. So uh, here, you may or may not use Navigraph, but if you do and you want to be able to see your charts, then this is available through the app. And of course, I'm just gonna import my route from SimBrief. So again, I did this all in SimBrief and it just downloads straight into the EFB. It's genius. They've done such a good job at this. Now I know other EFBs can do that, but I still, still uh, nice to see it here. Good, um, so I'm not gonna to talk too much about the charts. I don't wanna get bogged down with that because this, you may not be in Brussels. What we're gonna do now is power up the aircraft. As we arrive at the aircraft, uh, this is how we're gonna find it. Cold and dark, so it's been turned off, uh, but the GPU plugged in, hence the little green available light, which means there is external power available, but it's not in use. This is a typical configuration for finding the aircraft. Before we're allowed to power it on, we need to do a few things. Now, again, you may have questions about what I do from now on. Uh, I will try and explain them as we go, but of course, more detailed videos can be done on every step we take here. And I have in fact done them in the past on previous add-ons uh, for different simulators, in fact. So uh, it's many, many hours worth of video if we were to talk about it all in complete detail. This is gonna be a guide to get you going. So we have to check a few things. We need to make sure the airplane is safe to have power applied. We don't, for example, want the landing gear lever to be in the wrong place or the weather radar to be left on because if we power up the aircraft, things could start moving, weather radars could come on uh, and it could be a problem. So we're gonna check that the engine master switches are off and their mode selector, which is in the middle, is in normal position in the middle. We're gonna check that the weather radar is indeed turned off. You can click on the armrest to get out of the way. So weather radar off means this system switch in the middle to off and predictive wind shear also needs to be in off. That's what PWS is. If it's not, the predictive windshield will actually turn on when the engines start running, not straight away, but regardless. So off and off. 
Good. Landing a lever, we're going to check it is in the down position. Both wiper selectors need to be in the off. So there's one here and one here. That's because if they move, uh, they could scratch the windscreen. You can see there's dirt on the windscreen already. Uh, so if we were to have that dirt rubbed in dry into the glass, that would scratch it. These are incredibly expensive. They're heated, they're uh, shockproof, bird proof and all sorts. So they're very important that they are looked after. Then we can go onto the overhead panel and check the batteries and put them into auto. So they're currently off battery switch one and two. Let me get the, hopefully the right shortcuts. There we go. Uh, so batteries one and two, we need to check the voltage is above 25.5 volts, which they are. They're usually slightly different and they will drain over time, of course, but they're both good. So check on and on. Now there's lots of great sound effects and so on, but I'm not showing those so much today. We are guiding you through this aircraft. External power push button switch can now come on. So here we go. It says avail, clunk, and it all turns on. I'm just gonna give you some sounds. All of the avionics, air conditioning and so on will now come to life. You can see the screen's going to self test and so on. That's all fine, we leave it alone. We'll hear some bings and bongs in a second as the flight control, flight warning computer comes to life, but that's all normal. So external power is now on. Next, we can test the APU fire. So we test here, you'll get the lights, you get the squib light, and if you look down here, you'll actually get it on the ECAM. But you'll notice there's no warning. That's because it's too early to do it. That flight warning computer I talked about, we need that to come to life first. So we're gonna hear those clicks in a moment. It does take a, a little while. And you can see there it is. That triple click tells me the computer is now live and you see the warnings come up. So now if I press it, there's the warning and down here APU fire. So that works, that's good, the APU is available to us. I'm not going to start it just yet, we'll wait until we're nearer departure. Next we're going to make sure the air conditioning panel is set, so it, you can leave it alone. We don't typically touch it at this point, packs can be left in the on position with the fault light, that's absolutely fine. Then we're going to make sure that the speed brake lever is retracted and disarmed, so that is fully forward there and disarmed which means pushed down that would be armed we want it disarmed we're going to check the parking brake handle is on and that we have brake pressure so that is left and right and we want this needle to be up here in the the high above the green band basically it's typically two and a half thousand to three thousand psi something like that so this is a, a good picture this means that there is pressure applied to the parking brakes which is good news accumulator as well needs to be in that little green band if it's not i've talked about this in previous videos you can actually run the yellow hydraulic pump or just wait until the cargo doors are closed and that will go back into the green band so don't panic if it's not there it's, it can uh, happen at this point we would now have to go and check a whole load of things around the flight deck that i'm not going to uh, go through today um, involves a bit of paperwork uh, checking the landing gear pins are in the right place and so on um, so what we're going to do is move on so someone will go and do the walk around and I can go into my flow. So we're going to go to the overhead panel. We can extinguish all the white lights basically, um, but what I'm going to do is show you how I would actually do it in real life. So we need to turn on the cruise supply oxygen, which is turned off when you're securing the aircraft overnight. Then we're going to turn on the ground control for the flight data recorder, which records audio on the ground even without the engines. It, it will automatically start when the engines start, but uh, we actually have to turn it on to record the audio during the briefing. As we move up, um, we can don't worry too much about this panel, but we're going to put the ADIS to align. We go one, then two, then three to align them. Sorry, I said you put them to align, but I didn't mean that. I mean, you just put them to nav. There is no align option. Uh, there is an attitude option, but no. all three go to nav. Then we move back down to the bottom of this panel. So you'll notice there's an order of these flows. Bottom, up, and then we go along here and up, and then on the right hand side, starting at the front and then up. Okay, so Get this right, there we go. So we're going to now move down here. Oh, retract those again. Moving down to external lights, I want the strobe lights on auto. That way, if we take off, they'll automatically come on. And I want the nav lights to go to system one or two. It really doesn't matter, one or the other. You don't need them in the daylight, though. But most people, most, most planes will have them on in the daylight. Anyway, beacon needs to be off, specifically. Run my turn off off, and the landing lights definitely retracted, and those light off. These are very bright, and they will damage the ground crew's eyes if they look straight into them. No smoking to auto and the emergency exit lights to arm. Seatbelt signs off until we're fully refueled. We are, yes, refueled. There's no refueling memo. We've got our 5.3 tons on board. So I'm gonna put the seatbelt signs on. 
all of the anti-ice can be off probe window heat off so this you don't need to adjust uh, cabin pressure selector needs to go to auto and make sure there's no white lights air conditioning we can leave it alone as it is auto packs both on temperatures as they are um, unless you see it otherwise we could do a battery test as well which is where you look down onto the uh, lower ecam let's see if i can get the camera right for that and then you would press the electric page and then we would turn them off and on one at a time and what we're doing is just starting it to charge and checking that the voltage sorry the amperage on the charge comes down within a certain time frame so that's actually quite a high voltage sorry a uh, high amperage so that would suggest it needs a charging cycle um, normally that would be a little bit uh, a little bit less there you go something like 26 amps reducing quite quickly if they do need charging then they need to be plugged in as they are now really they are charging at the moment but there's a, a bit of a, a longer time frame that they need to run for fuel pumps can come on at this point a lot of airlines don't but we will turn them on now and we can test the engine so hold test all the lights both the squibs and look down we should see engine two fire and you'll also if i get the right camera again you'll see a little fire light down here so let's see if i can show you on this engine test lights bell fire down there and engine one fire on the ecam so that is all working as we would hope good now down to the bottom here nothing to do here manual starts off ventilation are all in the lights out position very common for the airbus you just need it <laughs> no lights all the flight control computers are on no lights on those uh, and that is it for the overhead panel excellent next we're going to come to the instrument panel in the center we're going to set the q h on the standby altimeter so i'm going to do that now uh, make sure it's lit up brightly enough it's usually or some people will dim it when the airplane's left alone we're going to check that the anti-skid nose or steering switch is on and we can reset the clock ready for our flight so i'm going to leave that in off good then we're going to come down to the pedestal and the mcdu which leads into our fms i'm going to talk about separately later so we'll do that in a moment but we'll check the audios as we want so vhf1 we are listening to it because it's lit up and selected and we are transmitting on it because it's the one with the green light we can likewise also listen to as many of these as we want at once so we normally listen to one and two but transmitting it on one in box two we'll put guard one to one decimal five or the eightest frequency or something like that interphone also on that's how we listen to each other this switch in the middle we don't want to be transmitting to the ground staff if it's on interphone so anyone plugged in outside will be able to hear you rad means transmit the rest can be off lights i'm going to have on weather radar we're going to leave off uh, and uh, what i'm also going to do is come over and we're going to check the engine oil we have enough oil i need to check the oxygen 1800 psi that is the crew oxygen for the pilot so we're checking there is enough in there there is it needs to be it can go below a thousand but if it does there's a if it gets a little yellow box around it you have to consult a chart to make sure it is enough for your flight so 1800 is more than enough and finally hydraulics we need to check that these all three we have three hydraulic systems in the airbus green blue and yellow green and yellow are the main two blue is the electrical powered backup um, green and yellow supplied by engine pumps as well as the ptu if they need it anyway we're checking there's enough quantity hydraulics are used to power things like landing gear and flaps and spoilers and uh, uh, flight controls so very important systems hence there's three and the little arrow here shows us how much fluid is in the system or is in the reservoir so we need it in the green band which all three are so that is good finally then i'm going to make sure that the thrust levers are definitely at idle I'm going to make sure the transponder is set to standby. We're not using it yet, and the TCAS is on standby. I'm going to set it to above. You could also select all. Not too much of an issue um, there. I'm going to set it to system one because I'm going to be flying with altitude reporting on. Uh, again, don't. I wouldn't get too concerned about this unless you're flying on that sim. Down here, copy door is in the norm position, and the gravity gear extension is in the down and closed position. So that is all looking good. So now it's time we. Uh, move on and start thinking about how we're actually going to get out of here as well as loading up our fmgc so first of all let's hop down to the fmgc and we can clear that out i'm going to go to atsu aoc and what we're doing here is we're going to get the weather we need to know the airfield weather before we get underway hence how we could set the atis sorry set the set the q and h that we already did so ebbr I'm going to go for the METAR. Now this will work even if you're not connected to VATSIM. I'm not on VATSIM for this flight, so this will work for everybody. So then if I press return and return, then receive messages, weather data. There it is, QNH1020, CAVOK 26 degrees. So that is 
worth keeping a note of because we're going to need that for our performance calculations. So QNH 1020, 26 degrees, cav OK. And the wind is variable 2. Good. So you can see you can get the weather straight in here. We don't need to use the Microsoft Flight Simulator interface. Uh, it's it's there. I'm going to go to Flight Init and do Init Data Request as well. So this is the, talking about ACARS. This is an ACARS system that airlines will use to download the flight data and track the flights and provide uh, information like load sheets and uh, messages directly to the aircraft to the flight crew without having to use the radio systems. So not required, but we're going to do it anyway. So we're the B-Line 2103, Brussels to Heathrow, alternate EBOS, 45 minutes. Uh, and that's on the 18th of May, 22 and that's the time we requested it. So there we go, that is now loaded in. Uh, next, we have ATC request, but we're not gonna use this. This would be a VATSIM uh, CPDLC sort of thing, or you could use your PDC on there as well. Moving along then, uh, ATC delay is to do with uh, whether you're late out, sending, telling the airline why, and arrival message as well as talking to the airline ground station. So we're not gonna worry about that too much here. So we've done the flight in it, it's the only thing, and I've got the weather, great. Now we're gonna go back to MCDU menu, FMGC. This is the flight management guidance computer. So this is the important heart of the Airbus. This is what, where all the thinking goes on, the calculations are done. So let's go to that, and now we're going to run through the setup. Now I've done several videos on this, but uh, I'm going to run through a, 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 sim a simple but hopefully uh, useful version today. So to run the MCDU loading, we need to use the acronym DIFSRIP, which is D-I-F-S-R-I-P. And the reason is it takes us through the different pages we need to have information loaded in. So to start with, we have D for data, which is this page, which is in the uh, data aircraft status. This is telling us the engine type. We're checking the idle performance factors are correct. And we're also looking to see that we have the right navigation database valid for our flight. Now, this one is, of course, out of date, but that is expected being that we are using Navigraph. But there we go. So we're going to say that that is within date. Next is init. So this is the init A page. Init has two pages. If I press this arrow, I can go to init B. This is the wrong page. I need to be on init A. So this is D and then I, the diff strip, and the I is init A. Now I don't have to type this in because we've used SimBrief. I'm going to do init request and it's going to load in our from and to for us. You can, of course, just type it in if you want. To type it in, you type in any information you want into the scratch page at the bottom. Let me just clear that message by pressing clear. Uh, and you can just type in E B B R and then slash E G L L and then select here and it will go in there. To delete anything like that, we can just hold the clear. So that's now loaded in some of the information, but you'll notice not all of it. So what we're going to do now is load in our call sign. So remember, we have all of this available to us over on our EFB. We can actually close that and go to the pilot brief. And this is a very handy way to view this. Load in the latest SimBrief flight plan. And here it is. So we are the BEL2103. So I'm going to just type that in, BEL2103. Now different airlines will load in different information on this page. Um, but Cost and X is over here, Cruises and Cost and X 15. So I'm going to put in 15. Cruising at flight level, let's check. We are going to cruise at flight level looks like 200 at Costa and then the Airbus will automatically load in the ISA temperature there but we can actually put in the ground temperature as it's a bit hotter so ground temperature is plus 26 so that is D and I and then we're going to go to F now I can see that it has loaded in a flight plan so that's fine so what I'm going to do is go back to init A and go to wind and then wind request and now the Phoenix this is not on VATSIM it will load in the wind isn't that brilliant it's great so it takes a minute, but there it is. So it gives you climb wind, wind data, uplink, all loaded in through the ACARS. Fantastic. I had, haven't had to install any extra things for this. It's just working. It's just a real treat. So that is init A completely done. IRS init, by the way, used to have to click on the older aircraft. You'd click a line, but in this one, it uh, does it based on GPS, which is normal. Um, so that's good. We don't have to do anything with that. So D and I are done. Finally, flight plan. Or not finally. Next is flight plan. So we're starting from Brussels, Helen, Costa, Kegitz. Sasky, Inlod, Logan, and then arrival into Heathrow. Now I can check that. Oh, there's the boarding complete message. I can check that on the flight plan. We can see our route if I scroll down. Um, it's here. So that is what I saw in my MCDU. And of course, if we go back to Phoenix, it was also available here. There's our route, Helen, Costa, Sasky, Logan. So great. So it has loaded in the whole route. So if you ever want to return to the top of the flight plan, so I, uh, the, the current two waypoint or where you're starting from, just press flight plan. Uh, if you want to go to the bottom, press airport and it will take you to your destination airport in the flight plan. Those are little shortcuts, they're very handy. 
Right, so we know it's variable winds, so I'm going to go... Uh, oh, let me show you properly. So you click on the line select key next to your departure airport, Brussels, and then we're going to click departure. We don't need fixed info, offset, or any of the others. We need departure, and we choose our runway. So I'm going to depart from runway 25 right on the north side of the airfield. Then I know I'm going out via Helen, so I'm going to do the Helen 7 Charlie departure. Now, how you connect up flight plans and so on, um, if, you, if you're not aware, then it's a bit of a puzzle sometimes. That'll be a topic for a future video, but if you, if you do know how to do that, this is how you can select them. You can just copy me and follow this stuff as well, or in Microsoft Flight Simulator, there is a way you can see that in the planning stage, but that's all for the future. So Helen 7 Charlie, and then you have to select Insert. It goes in amber, and you'll actually see it on your nav display, a yellow dotted line. If I select Plan on the EFIS control, I'll see it again. If I select Constraints, I'll see any constraints that are also along that route or on that departure. Great, so that is looking sensible to me, insert. So now that runs through to Helen and then the rest of our flight is connected. So now I want to put in my arrival for Heathrow, it's a short flight, so I'm gonna press airport again, select Heathrow, arrival, uh, and then it's ILS 9 left we said we would expect, and we are arriving via the Logan oh, 2 hotel for this one. Excellent, insert, and there we are. We now have a full flight plan, all the way to landing. Next is secondary flight plan. So in secondary, I can copy the active uh, and then in here, you can put in whatever you want. This is what, something that we could potentially activate if we needed it. If I press it again, you can see activate secondary. But what this is, is a backup flight plan that we aren't gonna use. It's just in there if we need to suddenly start doing something clever like returns to the airfield. So what I could do is modify this, but that's a topic for another video. So I'm gonna leave the secondary flight plan as it is with just a copy in it. It's often used for a sort of a return or an emergency term procedure if you have one of those because of terrain or something nearby. So D-I-F-S-R, we're on to RADNAV. Now the Airbus auto-tunes radio nav aids. So what I'm going to do is go over to my charts, Navigraph, and Brussels Airport. Let's go to ground charts. Oh, excuse me. And I'm going to bring up it's far too many ground charts here. Just a rough airport chart, and I'm going to favorite it with a little star. That shows me where we are. So the planned taxi route is out here and up here to the runway 25 right. Then I'm going to go to the SID. I'm going to find the SID I've selected. So looking for the Helen 7 Charlie. Yes, it is this bad trying to find them in the real <laughs> applications. And we're going to click on that. I've favorited it, and that's what we're doing. Straight ahead, above 700 feet, right, above 1700 feet, and then out to Helen. Um, so that is the departure. It's based on the Brussels VOR bub. So why did I look at that? Well, I can just check it's tuned something sensible, which it has the BUB VOR. So I'm going to leave that alone. I most commonly do not select NAVAID unless there's some specific reason, like an emergency term procedure. A big topic for another video. The Airbus will automatically tune VORs. If you want to see them on your screen, uh, you can simply select one of these needles. You've got VOR1, VOR2. So I'm going to have VOR1 displayed uh, in arc mode, and then you can see it there, bub. And the needle will actually be on the screen. If I point nav, you can see the needle there pointing over to the VOR just off our right hand side. So that works, and that's great. So red nav, leave to auto tune. Next, init B, there's a second I, diffs rip. So red nav, init B. B. So this is the second init page. So you just go to init and then the sideways arrow to get to init B. Here we need to enter some performance information. So going back over to our EFB, what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to, oh, you know that. We're going to go back to our load sheet. So mass and balance. And we need some key information here. I need to know the aircraft zero fuel weight and it's zero fuel weight CG. So here it is, 56.7, I'm going to round it up, and 31.3. So we're going to type that in up here, see, zero fuel weight, zero fuel weight CG. So the zero fuel weight is the weight of the aircraft without fuel. So it's the weight of everything, including passengers, but it does not include the fuel figure. And there's a reason it's done like that. So let's put that in. That is 56.7, 31.3. 56.7 slash 31.3. Now this is realistic. You have to type this in in the aircraft uh, absolutely yourself. Good. And then we're going to put the block fuel in. Now we wanted 5.3 tons of fuel. It has got 5.3 tons of fuel. I'm going to put in 
in it goes. Take off rate 61.8, that should be roughly what you expected it to be. Uh, and then it will eventually calculate the others. There you go, landing weight is below max landing weight. Alternate fuel is what it thinks it's gonna take us to get there. We can adjust that if we want, not important that right now. Final reserve time, taxi fuel, 200 kilograms. So it thinks we have two tons of extra fuel on board. So that's pretty good. That's because the alternate fuel is probably a lot higher. By the way, if you are interested in the alternate fuel, I can simply go back to my flight plan. And uh, in planned fuel section, alternate fuel for Ost is 1.5. So I'm going to put that in. Yeah, it's not a very practical alternate too far away. If we put that in, we'll see that we actually only have 800 kilograms of extra fuel. Uh, route reserves is 100 kilograms. It will automatically calculate 5% unless you select otherwise. So there we go. So that is init B now fully complete. So diff strip, we've done data, init A, flight plan, secondary flight plan, rad nav, init B, final step then, performance. So for that, we are going to the EFB departure perf. So in here, it's very simple. We've got Brussels. We need to select the correct runway, runway 25 right, and it's dry. We know it's dry. Then aircraft configuration, we can sync to the load sheet. Look at that. So we've got 61.8 tons, Mach Tau 29.9. This isn't the zero fuel weight. This is the actual takeoff weight. So it's our zero fuel weight plus the fuel. And this is the CG when you take into account the fuel as well. Then we can sync the weather. So this is the weather at Brussels. So a bit of a tailwind, 26 degrees, QNH 1020. Isn't that great? So we, we really just needed to make sure we had the right runway. Then I'm going to click Calculate. Runway information at the bottom and the weather is also shown there. It's just so, so easy. This is such a treat to operate this aircraft. Over here then we get what this page needs to look like. So 25 right, you can see it's a flat bar takeoff, flex 68, 32, 32, 35 on the speeds. Uh, what you'll also see is there's four knots of tailwind and there's a topple which is takeoff performance limit this is the maximum weight we could be 84289 so that's much higher than our current weight which as we know is only 61.8 uh, instead of 84.3 so we are fine to to use these numbers so no shift flaps one flex 68 let's put that in no shift flaps one flex of 68 the flex temperature is the reduction in thrust so the higher this number goes up to it goes up to 70 degrees just below sea level or 69 degrees uh, above um, this the higher this temperature then the um, lower the thrust is going to be on takeoff so the more efficient it will be in, on the fuel you can put in by the way flaps and that's THS trimmable horizontal stabilizer but you don't need to and I don't bother I don't know many airlines that use that right v1 is 132 vr is 132 v2 is 135 so 132 132 135 132 132 135 good and our clean speed of 209 also matches our performance calculation so we know that this is a sensible calculation because this is what the, the EFB has told us our performance calculator told us but this one here is generated by the airplane itself so it's a good check that all our numbers are matching up now v1 speed is our decision speed we can only reject the takeoff below that speed above that speed we must continue uh, even if the engine fails and will then rotate at 132 knots vr is v rotate and then v2 is our minimum climbing away speed if we've had an engine failure especially so that's what those speeds signify again a whole video on its own good so that is the fmgc loaded by the way i'm just going to use the second mcdu because they are available to us and i'm going to go to back to aoc remember if you want to get to that you just go to mcd menu atsu oh excuse me mcd menu atsu AOC and in here I can go to receive messages and you'll see a load sheet has arrived this load sheet arrives because we've um, set up everything from Simbri so we click on this and we need to accept it this would actually arrive um, often as you're taxing out or as you're just about to push back uh, this is telling us that all of the figures we planned with on this load sheet that we had in here remember our Simbri load sheet effectively is telling us that is valid that it's come true not all, airlines, not all airlines use this system, but the reason Phoenix have this is because it's quite a popular system where you can have it that if your passengers haven't shown up, for example, um, you can produce a load sheet before the flight departs that's useful for the pilots to set up with. And then uh, as they actually do depart, they'll get the actual figures. So it's sort of like you've got a, an additional rough idea with the load sheet that you're doing your planning with. And then on the taxi out, you'll get sent this message telling you whether or not it is true. So this is compliance, this has worked. If it didn't work, we would need to change our performance. For example, if the takeoff weight had gone up by two tons or something like that, that's what this is all about. So it's very cool that they've got this modeled, 
but I don't want to overcomplicate right now. So I've just clicked accept uh, and that's done for us for now. Um, but you'd normally do that during the taxi out. So we're getting uh, a little bit close to our departure time, I would imagine. If we go back to my flight, uh, let's see. I think we're supposed to go in one minute. Um, so what I'm going to do is go to the charts. We would, of course, have a cleared altitude off of this departure. This is actually to flight level 60. So I'm going to put in flight level 60 in the window, 6000. I'm going to have constraints showing and the Q and H on both sides. Everything else can be with dashes. This is correct. I want to see an FMAs, which are these flight mode enunciators on the top of my PFD, blank. Then we've got climb and nav in blue, which means they're armed. One FD2, which is talking about the flight directors. If these switches are off, you'll get it like this, a little dash. And if they're both off, you'll see nothing there. Uh, this is no good. This is not going to help us on takeoff. This is a flight directors off. So we want them on. So I'm going to turn both flight directors on. So I see one FD2. Over on the left side, we have our speed. So our V1 speed of 132 and our V2 of 135. Uh, v rotators is, is hidden away. We've got our 6,000 feet stopping. We, I know that's going to be a flight level, so I will set standard in the air. But there it is in the window. So this is a good PFD. shows that we've got most things set up. On the nav display, I'm going to zoom into something a bit more useful. So there we go. I can see where we're parked and the initial departure. There's the constraints showing me that 700 feet here, 1,700 feet over here. Without constraints, you won't see those pink bits of information. You can select something else like NDBs or maybe the VORs, uh, but those aren't very useful compared to constraints. So on departure, it's typical to have constraints showing. Good. So finally then, what would happen at this point is uh, someone would have run a takeoff brief. So I've already briefed you roughly on our plan, but uh, we're going to push back straight, then head out of this apron, use the outer taxiway over here, uh, which if I zoom in you can see is called outer 8, outer 7 and we'll hold at echo 7 for a full length departure from runway 25 right here in Brussels. After departure, climbing straight ahead, we need to be above 700 feet and then above 1700 feet. By the way, I know that I will make those restrictions because on the flight plan page these little amber, sorry, these magenta asterisks tell me there is a restriction. If I select it, I can see what that restriction is. It says out constraint plus 700 which means we must be above 700 feet. Because it's in magenta, it means the aircraft thinks it will make it. And as you can see, the aircraft has written 1,065 feet. So it knows it'll be above the 700 feet. Likewise, here, uh, we need to be above 1,700 feet plus 1,700. And it's showing us flight level 46. So all sorted. This 250 knot limit is normal. That's on uh, just coded into the Airbus for every flight out around Europe because below on flight 100, we want to do 250 knots. If it didn't think we could make the restriction, it would be a, uh, an amber asterisk. And then you'd be able to see a, probably a number that was lower than 1065. So it would show an amber saying, I'm not going to make that restriction. Very handy. Uh, and that is it. We'll talk about briefings another time. What we're going to do now is, and what would happen at some point around now, is go back to the Phoenix. We need to connect the tug. So ground services, uh, the tug will definitely need to connect. Now, when the tug connects, here it comes, they will be desperate to uh, disconnect the ground power. So we need to turn on the master switch for the APU. Let me get the right one. There we go. So that is by, I'll just do it again. So we simply press master switch on, you get a blue light, then you have to wait three seconds before you can press the start switch. Then you press start and it says on. That will run as on for a while and then it will say avail when it's ready. This APU is the little jet engine in the tail. So currently it is powering on the flap is opening and then it will start up all on its own it's very self-controlled there you go flap open because the ground crew won't be able to connect the tug until uh, well in most cases they can't connect the tug until you've got rid of the ground power unit we can't disconnect the ground power until our apu is available so you must wait So the APU is now available. That screen will automatically go back to the door page. APU is available down here, so it's giving us electrical power if I turn off the external power. So external power off, that goes green in the veil, and then the APU just stays as it is. So let's get rid of the GPU. That would disconnect that at the front. Great stuff. Before we can push back, we need to run the checklist. So I'm going to do that. By the way, you can see my jetty did automatically disappear. I didn't need to toggle it. That's because in SIM settings, Controls, auto jetway simulation, auto door simulation are on. So they have closed up, which is just great. That's what we wanted. Good. Right, back to my flight. So we need to run the checklist now. So if we go to pilot brief, documents, there is a normal checklist. 
Before start, copy prep is completed and completed. A good sign for that is that you should have no white lights showing on the overhead panel. The ABU should be running and after a couple of minutes, you need to let it warm up. They recommend about three minutes. We turn on the APU bleed. This now provides air pressure to the bleed system, which is what we're going to use to start the engine. It also ventilates the cabin. So these days, and in hot weather, you'd have this on much earlier in the process. So realistically, at 26 degrees, you'd have had to have this on or have an air conditioning unit outside. But that's a whole other topic. <laughs> so APU bleed on. Needs to be on. Good. So there's copy prep completed. Barrel ref, QNH1020 is set. And set and set, all three. ACARS initialized, we've done that, you'll remember that from earlier. That was the MCDU menu, ATSU, flight init, and we initialized our flight. Park brake set, so the parking brake is back here, it is indeed on, and it shows pressure here, and it says park brake up here. Fuel on board, we wanted 5.3, 5.3, although it's now burning with the APU. Init B loaded, remember if we go to init, and then the arrow to the side, and it B, which is the weights and so on, very important page, it is all loaded. Flex temp, we go back to perf, shows us flex of 68. And takeoff speeds, we've got 32, 32, 30, or 132, 132, 135, 209. So that's all looking good. Next, we need to get start clearance from air traffic control. Now, we're not using VATSIM, so I'm going to say that we've done that. So we go through our little flow to check we are ready to actually push. So the windows need to be closed with a little red ring around them. Uh, a good sign they're not closed is if you see it like this. <laughs> so let me slide it out of the way and then you can click that back and then slide it forwards and then click on that. So that is closed and closed. Um, then we're going to make sure the thrust levers are at idle. Definitely need to be at idle. We're going to put the transponder to auto so that air traffic can see us, you'd have your squawk code in there if we were using air traffic. And you're going to put the beacon on, which is the red light above and below the aircraft. This allows the ground crew to know we're about to start engines or start moving. Then we can run our checklist. So, start clearance, passenger signs on and auto, they are indeed. Beacon we turned on, that was the red light. Transponder is in auto, all doors are closed. We can check the doors page down here. You can see it's automatically armed the slides as well. How great is that? Such a, a nice touch. They would arm uh, around about now or as you push back. So that's the before such check is complete. We're going to say that we're cleared to push back. So I'm going to go to Phoenix, Ground Services. Now before we push back, you want to check that you have your nose wheel steering disconnected message. This is to make sure that the hydraulics to the nose wheel, nose wheel are making sure they're not connected so that when we power up the engines, or when we, which will automatically power the hydraulics, this way the nose will not turn or snap because that would damage the tow bar or cause an injury downstairs so nose wheel steering disconnect message must be there it is i'm going to release the parking brake and i'm going to click start so we're pushing back Now you can start engines whilst pushing back. So let's start our engines. If we're doing two engine taxi, we start engine two first. If we're doing single engine taxi, you start engine one first. We're gonna do two engine taxis today for simplicity. To start engines, we would check with the ground crew and we're gonna move this mo uh, mode select switch to ignition start. So there it goes to ignition start on the right hand side. This brings up the engine page down here and you can see we have pressure at the start valve which is shown at the bottom. 28 psi that's good for starting the engine so i'm going to start it by simply putting the master switch to to on i'm also going to start my timer to make sure that it takes a normal amount of time to start i'm also keeping an eye out where i want to push back so somewhere on this center line that's going to be good enough probably a bit too far already <laughs> so we need to go back to ground services whoops and stop and then it will slowly come to a stop now what's happening for the engine start is the Valve has opened, it's pushing air through, which is turning the N2, and the ignition system B is active, which is lighting up the fuel, which is going in, in fuel flow. Um, so we'll show you properly with the uh, engine one start. So that's now gone. I'm going to set the brakes, and we're going to get rid of the tug. So these numbers will keep accelerating. Then the start valve closes, telling us that uh, now the engine is stabilizing on its own. N1 has reached 18%. The EGT is still rising, which it will, and then it will settle down a little bit uh, as the engine stabilizes. Once it's all done, we'll get an avail message here on the engine display, and that's a good sign we can start the next engine.
There we go, avail. That's telling us the engine's up and running. So let's start engine one. Same idea. That it stays in ignition, master switch forward, opens the start valve. That in turn spins the N2, which is not the fan at the front of the engine, it's the uh, compressor behind it. That's spinning. Then we get fuel flow shortly. There's the fuel going into the engine. Ignition system A is igniting it, and that gives us an EGT, exhaust gas temperature. Once we see fuel flow going in, we need to see an EGT rise soon afterwards to make sure that the fuel is igniting and not just being poured into the engine and sitting there because that could of course eventually catch fire later so seeing an EGT is a good sign that the fuel is igniting as normal and being burnt off which is what we want so same again here the tug by the way has driven off back to the stand okay good that's all done so after that we put the mode select back to norm oh then we go onto the overhead panel turn off the APU bleed we don't need it We've got the engines providing our air now. We don't need the APU, so the engines are providing our electricity now. Uh, and then we're going to come down here. We're going to arm the speed brakes. We're going to reset the rudder trim by pressing this. just drives it to zero. For example, if you had a bit of rudder trim left over from the previous flight, back to zero. And then we're going to set our takeoff flap. We set flaps to one, as I can see here, and check it on there. Then we can check on this display up here that one plus F is showing, which is our flap setting for takeoff. And we need to set our takeoff CG um, which we can find on our departure perf um, or you can see it on the load sheet but we have a Mac Tau 29.9 so about 30 so to set that all you have to do is scroll this to CG 30 so you see 30 there so I'm going to you can actually click and drag this wheel which is great <laughs> so there you go about 30 that sets the stabilizer on the back this to the right angle for takeoff given the balance of the airplane on the day okay so now let's go to our checklist so pilot brief and we're going to run the after start checklist. And let's see what we've forgotten. So ground equipment is removed. Anti-ice we're not using today, so that is all off. That would be the engine anti-ice it's talking about, which is up here, but we're not using it. Flaps config 1 plus F is up there, which is correct. That's what we wanted. APU is off. Yellow electric pump is off. That's to do with single engine. We're not using that today. By the way, if you're wondering where it is, it is up here. Electric pump yellow. So that is off with no light. Trims, we've got 30% and zero, so it's talking about this trim and the rudder trim at zero, hence it says zero. Cabin doors are armed, ECAM status checked. So the doors we did see earlier, they are armed, which means there's a white slide message, which tells us that if the door is open, the slide will automatically inflate. So the middle two will stay like that all the time because they are the overwing exits, but the doors need to be armed by the crew, which is done so that's good and ecam status would be a little status sts message here telling us there's a problem um, and if you were to press the status here it would show you the problem but luckily it says normal and there's no message the airplane is in good shape so that is the after start checklist complete so no no prizes for guessing what comes next we need to start our taxi out i would start the timer which is you can check that the engines have warmed up they need uh, it depends on the engine so we're not going to worry about that today but what we're going to do is Check it's all clear on the left, all clear on the right. You'd of course obtain your taxi clearance. To taxi, we turn the nose light to taxi, not TO, which is for takeoff, just the taxi. And the runway turnoff lights can come on as well. Most airlines do that. Not required, but I can show you what that is. They provide a bit more visibility. So you've got taxi light here, and then these two at the side point sideways. They're the turnoff lights. Helps to show that the aircraft is uh, underway. And at night, of course, helps you see around corners before you get moving. So, lights are on, then we're going to release the parking brake. Brakes released. Aircraft will roll slightly under its own power, especially at these lighter weights. Look at the texturing on this scenery as well. This is a really nice simming experience, I've got to say. And we're going to make our right turn. Now we do need to do a brake check, but I won't do that in the turn in case we run out of energy doing it. So I'm going to get the nose of the aircraft round. There we go. And now we're going to do a brake check where we squeeze the toe brakes. We don't need to bring the aircraft to a stop. All we're doing is checking the brakes are working and efficient. The pilot monitoring will check that these needles don't increase. The reason is these needles are attached to the yellow hydraulic system, which applies the parking brake. It is also the backup braking system we have, uh, because of course it's important we have a backup of the brakes. So if that those needles did rise, it would signify that the changeover to the green braking system had not happened, and therefore we were running on alternate brakes. So let's give it a check. Nope, those needles stayed flat, the brakes worked, that's the brake check complete. Now I'm going to taxi out to the outer taxiway as we said over there, but as we do that, it's nice and empty on this apron. We've already done our load sheet, I showed you that earlier, so I'm going to have flight plan on that page, 
take off um, on performance on this page and we'll run our flight controls. For this we're going to move the side stick fully back, fully forward, fully left, fully right and we're going to run the rudders full left and full right. So full up and as we move the controls past a certain deflection this lower display will actually automatically go to the flight control page. This is the genius of the Airbus. It knows that you need these things when, when you need them. So lo and behold, here it is. So I'm pulling fully back. This is not a check of this. This cross is distracting on the PFD, but it is not relevant. This is simply uh, an indicator of where the side stick is, but we need to check the flight controls have moved. So I'm pulling fully back on that side stick. So I want to see that the elevators are in the full up position, which they are. As we release it, they'll go neutral, and then we go full down, and they go fully down. Now we don't want to roll onto a runway by accident whilst doing this, so I'm going to turn up here, head along our outer taxiways. Good. Next, of course, no surprise, and if you've been a passenger, you'd have seen this happen a lot. We're going to go full left and full right, and this is where you can see the ailerons moving. They need to move, by the way, into the white box. If they don't reach the white box, that's a sign there's a problem. So full left, full right. You can actually see that they're not in the middle, they're in this little box here, which is the drooping position for takeoff. If we look at the ailerons outside, you'll see that they aren't quite fully um, up. They are slightly drooped, which is where they are for takeoff. A bit of extra flap. Um, so there you go. So full flight control checks, you'll see aircraft doing this. You'll see it from your seat as a passenger as well. So ailerons and elevators are done, uh, and we would also do the rudder. Now I'm using my rudder pedals uh, to drive the aircraft along the ground which is automatically doing the tiller which is a setting the Phoenix has. If you have a separate axis for your nose wheel steering tiller then you have the option to use the pedal disconnect to um, to run the uh, that check where you would disconnect it and then you could run your pedals. So I'm but I'm uh, I haven't got that set up right now. Once you've done that the other pilot will do their own and then they will check through the flow so we could turn on the weather radar now if we wanted it then the predicted wind shear can go to auto but I don't think that's an option right now uh, we can put the TCAS to TARA we can put the auto brake to max now that would work both by clicking on it but I have the Thrustmaster TCA system so I need to actually wind it to max but I must say the Thrustmaster TCA brake selector switch does work very well with this aircraft Good, finally then we need to press takeoff config down here which runs this ECAM memo which says TO and it should all be green to tell us that we are ready to go. Excellent stuff, let's run the checklist. Oh, one last thing, brief, I need to do a little brief. So pilot flying will just check uh, that everything is set as they want for the departure or if anything has changed, like is it a different runway or a different departure, different cleared altitude, something like that. So uh, I'm going to be taking off from runway 25 right, it's over there, going in that direction, right turn after takeoff. Uh, we're going to be under max landing weight when we do with a flap one takeoff, slight tailwind on the takeoff, uh, and then we're going to climb up to a flight level of 6,000, so flight level 60, so we'll need to set standard uh, whilst we are climbing away. Something like that. So you want to check that the level in here is the correct level or altitude. Right, let's roll forward to our cat one point. Good, and then we can run the before takeoff checklist. So flight controls are checked TCAS is TARA departure brief confirmed takeoff data and FMA so this is where we double check that we have 132 132 135 209 and that the FMAs say 132 135 climb nav blue 152 and R6000 flaps are config we want to see 1 plus F green which we do 1 plus F green I'm going to bring it to a stop at that holding point ECAM memo takeoff and it says no blue because of course we want to see that all green to tell us everything is done if it isn't one of those lines will be in blue. Okay, just bring it to a stop there, setting the parking brake. Good, so that is us down to the line. Next is when we're clear for takeoff, take, we have the last few items. So, let's go. So we're going to imagine we're cleared to take off. So we look on the approach, check there's nothing out there. Then we need to turn on all our lights. So both of these go from retract to on. Strobe lights go to on. Nose light goes to take off. Some airlines will give a, a ding to the cabin crew uh, in various forms or maybe a little PA. Um, but we don't need to do that today. So before takeoff check is below the line now. Take off runway. We're going to check that we have got the right runway, which is 25 right. I can see it written over there. And we have the signs for it. It's actually in red down here as well. Then we've got strobe lights on and the packs on. We're doing a packs on takeoff today, so that means that would be a pack off. 
we want it on so white lights out so that is the before takeoff checklist complete so let's now line up and we'll talk through the takeoff brakes released you can take off in an airbus without stopping so you can actually roll onto the runway and uh, and just go which you you will probably experience as a passenger but today we're going to do a stops takeoff where we come to a stop on the runway as if we were waiting for clearance from air traffic control or something like that so let's talk through it what we're going to do is set 50 percent on the n1s initially uh, when we are ready to go we're going to let the engine stabilize there whilst doing that we hold the aircraft on the tow brakes then when we're happy they've stabilized we can release the tow brakes let the aircraft start rolling and move the thrust levers from where they are at idle and they'll move forwards two clicks it is so they'll go from thrust idle to climb and then flex MCT so I'll show you where that is uh, in just a moment the reason is we're doing a flex takeoff if you haven't entered a flex temperature and you're going full toga i.e. you haven't used a performance calculator that is also fine uh, and it's fine even if you've used the flex takeoff in the performance calculator or even if you've entered it into the MCDU so I'm going to bring the aircraft to a stop and hold it on the tow brakes um, even though we've got a flex temperature it's still totally valid for us to just go full thrust to toga if we're unsure or for some reason something happens or we think that maybe there's wind shear or something I don't know but that will work whatever you do if you accidentally just go full toga it's no issue don't mess around just leave it at toga if you're happy that everything else is okay with the takeoff so as I said holding on the tow brakes like I am now you're going to then stabilize the engines at 50% and one which you can see up here by moving the blue donuts as I move the thrust levers they move you can see that they show us the commanded position of the th thrust so you'll move that to 50, let them stabilize, then release the tow brakes and apply the takeoff thrust by moving the thrust levers through to the flex MCT click point up here. We're then going to check, whilst keeping the aircraft straight using our rudder, that the right FMAs appear. So it should say man flex and then the flex temperature, so 68. So it should say man flex 68 and then we'll see some green modes appear here that will activate the flight directors. It will say SRS and it may or may not say runway. It doesn't matter if it doesn't. Uh, SRS speed reference system, a whole video on its own. But these are the flight director modes we're going to follow for the takeoff. So man flex, 68, SRS, maybe runway. That's what I'm expecting to see. We're also, as soon as we um, set the power, we're going to actually put half side stick deflection on. So just half nose down. We leave that there. As we pass through 80 knots, we gently release it to neutral by 100 knots. Okay. But today, that, that would be normal if we had a headwind. We actually have a slight tailwind today, so there's a slightly different technique. I'm going to pretend we have a headwind. So that's the more standard version uh, with the tailwind. We actually do full side stick down, but that's, again, for another video. So half side stick is the typical one, and as we go through 80 to 100 to neutral. When you hear V1, you don't do anything. When you hear rotate, you'll rotate the aircraft, but pulling back at about 3 degrees a second on the side stick. Uh, sorry. You're going to pull back on the side stick, but you want the aircraft to nose up at about 3 degrees a second. So it should take you about 5 seconds to reach about 15 degrees, which would be a typical initial pitch. And then we're going to follow the flight directors. Now, it sounds very complicated, but I'm going to um, talk through it as we go. And then you can hopefully pick up on it and uh, rewatch it if you need to. I do have other takeoff tutorial videos already on the channel that go in more detail th th than this will. Right, so let's get underway. Holding on the tow brakes. We're going to start the timer. Uh, that's something the pilot monitoring should do, though that's not really our concern as pilot flying. So I'm just going to do it now. Holding on the tow brakes, 50% where we let the engine stabilize. That's all looking good. I've got my half side stick in. So going to this view now, I'm going to release the brakes and then move those thrust levers two clicks. So there's climb, there's flex MCT. Now on the FMAs, on the top of that PFD, have we got what we want? Man Flex 68 was what we said. SRS and Runway have appeared. Auto Thrust has armed and blue. So that's all looking good. The Auto Thrust is something I should have mentioned. Through 80 knots, I need to start releasing the side stick to neutral by 100. There it is. And now we can see the little one appearing, which is our V1. And the little dot is the rotate, the blue dot. So there it is, V1 and rotate. And the magenta diamond, obviously, V2. So pulling through three degrees a second there's 15 degrees and now I'm going to follow the SRS positive climb as soon as we're climbing away from the ground we can raise the landing gear so that comes up and nav mode has engaged and now we can just follow those flight directors it's that simple SRS and nav SRS is the climbing mode it's the vertical mode nav is the lateral mode so we can simply follow those the autopilot is available from just a few seconds after liftoff in the Airbus it does work people do it on the line no problem at all so we could already engage it 
So I am actually going to engage it now uh, so I can talk to you. So there's Autopilot 1, which will appear on the right-hand side to check it has engaged. Good. So that's us taking off, flying along the SID, and the gear is definitely up, the light's out. You can see it's now saying leave a climb. It flashes that because we've gone through our acceleration altitude. It will do that automatically based on the setting and the performance page. So I can bring the thrust levers now back one click to climb. Thrust climb auto thrust have engaged. That's all good news. And the speed is accelerating. Above the green S, I can move the flaps from 1 to 0. So there they go. Flaps now traveling to 0. It's important to note if we took off flap 3, then different things would appear there. Again, that's for a future video uh, or one of my previous videos, <laughs> depending how you uh, want to view it. Once the flaps are selected to 0, we can disarm the ground spoilers. We don't need those anymore. And we can get rid of the nose gear lights. So they are gone. Next, we are, remember, this is not an altitude we want to stop at. We're going to a flight level. So we're going to set standard by pulling on this little Q&H setter. I'm going to leave it for a second though just to show you what the Airbus will do because it's very smart. Earlier we had a transition altitude of 4,500 feet in here. So there it is and now it's flashing at us reminding us we should be on standard. So you pull for standard, pull for standard and then this is the exception we press for standards. And now we're going up to flight level 60 which it now says 1,000 feet to go it says speed out star. So that has all worked out nicely. Engine spooling back and we are underway. Now a lot happened there, of course, you may need to rewind it and go back and look through it. There's lots and lots and lots of details. As I said, that little sequence there was easily an hour's video. <laughs> so um, if you took off at a different flap setting, for example, that would change a lot of things. But that's a flap one takeoff for you. Uh, we'll talk about it again in the future. Let's do our after takeoff checklist. So landing gear is up uh, and you should check uh, that you have no lights up here as well. Then we have ECAM checked, so that is checking that the flaps are at zero and there's no other messages. And barrow F standard, so we've set standard. So our take of climb checklist is complete. And there we go, out. So we're now flying along the SID and we're underway. So thank you very much for watching. There'll be more tutorials to come, of course, where we talk about handling the aircraft in the air, the automatics, and of course, approach and landing and the setup of the aircraft for that. But hopefully this has given you an insight, if you're not familiar with the Airbus, of how to get it up and in the air. Do please subscribe if you'd like to see more of these videos. We'll see you again in another video or live stream soon. Bye-bye.